Awaken? Uh oh. Bro, this is freaking screwed, bro. Uh. Whoa. Oh, frick. How's it going, everybody? Hoodlumut here, back with some more Chaos Head Noah. And uh, last time, Bimi killed everybody. She killed everybody out here. She freaking went wild, freaking destroyed Orihara, freaking destroyed Senna, all to save Takami. She let out her negative emotions and her sword took control of her. And then because that happened, she freaking went into a fugue-ish, no, well, kind of a fugue she, she She went into a DID seemingly state, according to Takami, and now she is acting like a child, like a completely different person. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what we dealt with last time. That was pretty wild. Um, that's really the gist of it. That's that's the most important element, I think, because the rest of it was kind of just leading up to it. It was like little bits and pieces like, oh, she visited him in the hospital, you know, Takami in the hospital uh, after the O-Front situation. Who freaking cares? I, You know, it just says that she's nice. OK, great. The deaths of two people, I think, are most prominent, and that's where we're kind of at now. And so Takami's all freaking out, trying to figure out what do we do with the bodies, because the cops are going to come. And so when he goes to try and do something with the bodies, or at least inspect them, if not to actually do something with them, he finds that both Orihara and Senna's bodies have disappeared. They're gone, but the, the, the blood from their deaths is still there. So whatever that means... And so Taku's now freaking out because Themi isn't the same person who's going to be there to protect him because Takami's freaking selfish and we all know that and he doesn't care about anyone except himself for the most part. So that's where we're at. So without further ado, let's just get back into this, shall we? Themi, not that I knew whether or not to even call her that, had genuinely lost all her memories. Or... I supposed you could say this Themi didn't have memories at all. Is that my name? Themi? Yeah, that was that was the other thing is is she got like some form of amnesia or something because of this uh childlike personality switch or whatever, so. Yeah. It it is. Sakihara Themi. Sa Ki ha ta be me? Oh, so that's what it is. From the way she talked, you wouldn't think we were talking about her literal name. And you are? What's your name? I I'm Nishijo Takumi. Having to teach her something so basic, like day one stuff, was just... <sighs> Thinking about where this was going to lead just left me feeling even worse than before. Nishijo Takumi? Hi, Taku! What? Taku! It was the same. Her nickname for me was the same. Hey, Taku. My, um, my hands. They're all sticky. The dried blood on her hands clung to her skin. The dark red discolorization on her was Kozapi's blood. Or at least, it should have been. Her corpse had vanished but her blood still remained. I don't like being all sticky. Dimi looked pretty sad as she stared at her hands. I was reminded of Kozapi's smile and was hit with a horrible ache in my chest. Trying my best to hold myself together, I got a wet towel ready for her. H here, Sh show me your hands. When I told her that, Themi timidly held out both of her hands. Using the towel, I started cleaning the blood off of them. Every time I glanced at it, the previously white towel got redder and redder. To make sure I got it all off, 
I had to scrub kind of hard. As I wiped away the blood, making sure to get even between her fingers. <laughs> it tickles! Dimi laughed cheerfully. She must have had no idea why she had blood on her hands. Well, wasn't she freaking acting carefree? You know what? Clean them yourself. Why should I have to babysit you? But there was no way I could actually say that. Dimi had tried her best to protect me. And because of that, regardless of whether or not it'd been intentional, she'd killed someone. And then... Her heart and mind had broken completely. So, because every freaking route had to have a lewd scene so far, I have a feeling that the lewd scene for this one is going to be her being like, I need someone to comfort me, and, you know, she's like a child, so she's going to be all innocent about it, and it's going to be freaking, it's going to be weird weird in that freaking way. I can already see it. I can already see it. Why Watch me be right. She's going to be like, I just want you to hold me. I just want women. And it's going to be something like that. And it's going to get freaking gross. I can already see it coming. So. I couldn't just leave her here to fend for herself. After all. I was also responsible for her being like this. Th there. They're all clean now. Oh, thank you. Wow, my hands are all sparkly now. <laughs> I feel all squeaky clean. She took my hands, intertwined her fingers with mine, then innocently shook them up and down. She seemed so happy. It was like she was a little kid. For some reason, her smile left me feeling... wistful. Hey, Dimi, will y you protect me? Protect? What am I protecting? Me. Um, I don't really know what that means. But since you're my friend, you'll be nice to me anyway, right? So, I'm glad you're here being with me, Taku. <laughs> Interesting. It was no use. There was no point talking to her anymore. The Dimi who was supposed to protect me wasn't there anymore. I hung my head. Dimi wasn't supposed to be here. Where was her house? She needed to get home. I thought of reaching out to her family, but I couldn't find anything among her stuff with their contact information. If I went to school, the teachers there would most likely know her address. Problem was, it was already fairly late, so I probably wouldn't be able to get in to ask. Actually, now that I thought about it, I didn't really know much about Dimi. Where did she live? How big was her family? When was her birthday? What was her favorite food? I didn't know anything about her. And because of that, there was nothing I could do for her. Taku? Taku? <laughs> Dimi called my name as she pulled on the hem of my shirt. Hey! Taku! I'm hungry. What time was it? It was already dark outside, and also dinner time. Unfortunately, I didn't have any spare food here. I would have to go and buy something. Wh what do you want to eat? Hmm? Had she also forgotten about food due to her memory loss? Did she not know what different kinds of foods there were? What they tasted like? Oh, I know, I know. I want to eat some soba. Soba? I like soba a lot. 
You do? Yup! Why? H have you eaten it before? Have I eaten it before? Hmm... Don't think so. But I like soba a whole lot. What was going on? Was she starting to regain her memories? Or was her previous self's sense of taste the only thing she remembered? If she got her memories back, I'd be saved. For the time being, though, I had to go to the supermarket to buy some soba. Beamy, wait here. D don't leave this room no matter what. You hear me? Okay. Bishi. I tentatively struck the pose the previous Themi had done all the time. I put one hand up against my head as if I was saluting her. Oh, he did it. That's funny. Maybe this would make Themi remember. That was my train of thought, at least. But... Bishi? What's that? That's so cool! She had no idea what I was doing. Her eyes were sparkling with curiosity, not recognition. So, incredibly embarrassed, I bolted out of the room. <laughs> okay. She's gonna be gone when he gets back. On the way to the supermarket, I checked to see if the police were around or not. Just as I thought, Senna and Kozapi's corpses had disappeared. If there were any police around, then it was possible that there had been witnesses. But if there weren't, then that would mean no one had found them. In other words, we might have had some time before we were found out. Of course, I wasn't just wary of the police, but Shogun too. He could show up completely out of nowhere at any time, so I paid extremely close attention to any shadows where he could have been lurking in. Thankfully, I didn't feel God's gaze at the moment, but even then, I still didn't want to go out at night. The darkness scared me, and when I walked through the deepest parts of that darkness, I could faintly see the scene of the dead Kozapi and Senna start to form. Their bodies, mutilated and disfigured, slowly took shape. I quickly averted my eyes and hurried to the supermarket, keeping my eyes trained on my feet. Dang. Okay, oh, okay, so just there and back, alright. See if she's still there? Once I got back to my base, I got the portable stove and started boiling the water for the soba. My container didn't exactly have any form of ventilation, and there was flammable crap everywhere, so it was honestly pretty dangerous. Regardless, I went ahead and tossed the soba into the pot. Instant noodles, of course. Dimi was staring at the noodles with a spark of curiosity in her eyes. So that's how you make soba! Kozapi's pool of blood was still there. It was practically all dried up now. And since it was nighttime, it just looked like some weird black stain. I broke down all the empty cardboard boxes I'd piled up and set them over top of it. I knew it wouldn't solve the problem, but I still didn't want to see it if I could help it. Taku! Taku! It's about to spill! When I heard her say that, I went back to check the stove. It was boiling pretty intensely and it was on the brink of overflowing. But instead of doing anything about it, she just kept saying, Whoa! T turn off the burner. Huh? Hmm. Themi tilted her head, then turned the dial on the stove. The wrong way. <laughs> Whoa! It's spilling everywhere! Wowie! Yo, wowie, wait! Only Orihara said that! Did she take on Orihara's personality because she killed her? 
Oh no, what the frick? Did she take on like her cutesy personality, dude? Oh no. What? Wowie, my rear? I frantically pushed Beamy aside and turned off the burner. There was hot water everywhere. Eh, it shouldn't have really mattered. As long as it was edible, she shouldn't have cared too much about how it tasted or its texture. So, I took the pot, drained the water from it, and immediately rinsed the soba noodles. Though, it was worth noting that I'd only done so because the instructions told me to, not because I was some master soba chef. Did it, do you like it hot or cold? Cold! I plopped the noodles into a bowl, then poured in the base I'd bought as well. All I had for toppings was some green onion. I chopped it up to make a decent garnish, and then it was ready to go. I took Thimi back into my room in a hurry. I'd leave the cleaning for tomorrow when it was bright outside. Well, I mean, what if it rains? <laughs> what happens to all of your crap? It'll just bust. Not that that really matters, I guess, but, you know, that's what, that's what my mind would be thinking anyway. But right now, I wanted to spend as little time as possible outside. Especially since there was still the faint smell of blood out there. It felt as if Senna and Kozapi could show up even now. They'd be drenched in blood. And then, they'd start walking toward me like zombies. Sure, that was more based in a cult than reality. But it still scared me nonetheless. Didn't that happen in one of the other uh, endings? I think it was... Was it... I think it was... No, it wasn't Kozapi. Whose was it? Was it Ayase's ending? I think they might have done that, and and we had to like run from him, or it was like in his mind or something like that 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 happened. But that's interesting. Hey, Taku, can I eat now? Can I? It was pretty clear that Bimi didn't have any of the intense worries I had. Actually, maybe it was precisely because of those things that she'd changed into an entirely new personality in order to completely erase the memory of having killed people. Well, yeah, obviously. G go ahead. Yay! Thank you, Taku. She then grabbed the chopsticks I'd given her. She was holding them like they were a fork, though. And instead of using them, she stuck her mouth on the edge of the bowl and started slurping it up directly. Yeah. I don't care what anyone says. That's how a lolly eats. TYVM. What? TYVM? What's- Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. She must have even forgotten how to hold chopsticks correctly. She'd also forgotten how soba was made, and how to turn off a simple stove. And yet, she had remembered that it was polite to thank people for making stuff for you. Maybe that meant that her understanding of the world around her had regressed? I can't do it. Huh? I can't eat it! Bimi was getting frustrated at her own inability to properly eat the soba. And I mean, considering how she was trying to go about it, of course she wouldn't be able to. Feed me! <laughs> okay, yup. Here it goes. Here we go. Okay. Alright. Okay. What did you just say? Was she for real? She was asking me to feed her? I felt like I was her babysitter at this point. Or perhaps a dad? But having a daughter the same age as me? Oh, frick. I didn't know if I could handle that. <laughs> Taku! She pleaded with her puppy dog eyes. And since I couldn't really say no to those, I let out a sigh and gave in. <sighs> Here. Say, uh... <laughs> ah! Themi took the soba I was holding out to her 
in her mouth, then started chewing it with a smile on her face. She seemed to really like it. <laughs> it's really yummy. G glad to hear it. Suddenly, a thought crossed my mind. A laid-back, relaxing life with a 3D girl. That was definitely what I was looking for. A life with no overly dramatic Eroge-esque plot points. Not having to worry about the heroine's emotional baggage. Not having to worry about having feelings for each other, yet being too afraid to speak up. And not having to worry about getting dragged into a murder case. A life that you wouldn't find in books or video games. And yet, I had a feeling that was what I really wanted. Interesting. Okay, so now he's coming to this, like, like reality realization, right? He's, like, saying, I don't want the fake stuff. I want something real. It's interesting they're doing that right at the end, like, the lead-up to the, to the true ending. Hmm. Okay. And that very life was actually unfolding right before my very eyes. Not only that, but Demi was here with me, too. Being honest with myself... Dimi was cute. She'd also said she would protect me. And I, too, wanted to stay with her. Forever, if I could. But this was all... fake. A lie. This life wouldn't last. And Dimi... wasn't Dimi. Our time would be far too short-lived, far too fleeting. The thought of it made me feel sad, wistful, and empty. Come back. Dimi, come back, please. I couldn't help but whisper those words. You've got mail, you big dum-dum. Huh? I was taken by surprise. I'd heard Seratan's voice come from my PC. I'd just received an email from someone. Was it from Shogun? I had a bad feeling about this. This couldn't be good. I didn't want to look. D don't look at me. I felt the gaze. Someone was looking at me. It felt even more evident than usual. Oh, it's Shogun then. He, he sent the email. Okay. I looked around me, but there was no one besides me and Themi in this room. My hands had stopped, and because of that, Themi was fighting hard to try and wrestle the soba into her mouth. She wasn't looking at me, which meant that there was no one else it could have possibly been. I didn't even need to ask... Whose eyes are those eyes? Interesting. Groaning, I headed for the PC and checked my inbox. Awaken! Uh-oh. I'd only received one email, and the sender was... Shogun. Uh, crap. Crap. What was he plotting now? Was he going to kidnap Nanami for real this time instead of just faking it? Or maybe he was finally going to come and kill me directly once and for all. The fear made all my hair stand on end. The chills on the nape of my neck grew even stronger. I didn't feel any good, and my head was starting to hurt somewhat. Don't look at me! With trembling fingers, I clicked the mouse and opened the email. Huh? It's just awaken. Huh? There was nothing written in it. It was only the subject line, which read awaken. There was nothing written in the body. Awaken. What did he mean by that? Was he telling me to awaken as a giggle -a maniac You had to be freaking kidding me! 
I had a feeling he'd said something similar the first time we'd met. S stop screwing with me! It, 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 is scaring me th that much freaking fun for you? I was angry. But at the same time, I wanted to fend off the fear lurking deep inside me. I hit the keyboard hard with my hands. Static came from the speakers. Had I clicked something by accident? Ugh! Wake. To... <gasps> I'd... heard something. Mixed in with all that static. I'd heard something. I hurriedly checked my PC. The MP3 player wasn't running. And there weren't any videos playing in my browser. I thought maybe Shogun's email had included some kind of virus, but there were no files attached to it. T again. I'd heard it again. It was getting hard to breathe. Drops of sweat ran down my forehead. Uh, oh, I, I, I could just turn off the sound. If I did that, I'd stop hearing this extremely weird static. I opened the sound settings on the bottom right corner with the mouse. Then, I checked the option to mute everything in the volume mixer. Once I did that, I wouldn't hear anything. I wouldn't have to listen to that static, nor anything resembling a voice within the static. I was extremely tired, freaked out, but of course I was. It only been two hours since two people I knew had died right in front of me. Not to mention the weird stuff I'd seen at the hospital when I'd gone to visit Ayase, or the strange calls from Nanami. So I had to just be mishearing something amid the static ri- uh. Awaken. A voice. There's no time left. Was coming from the speaker. Soon, the third melt will occur. Uh, uh. I'd clearly heard it. It was him. That'd been Shogun's voice. The same voice that talked to me at Scramble Crossing. W why? I m muted it, didn't I? I know I did! Taku? What's a turd melt? <laughs> Bimi, acting just as she had been for the past couple hours, tilted her head as she looked at me with innocent eyes. I came up close to her grabbed her by the shoulders, and shook them. Th Thimi, please! Pull yourself together! Uh, ow! Th that hurts. Say it! Say you'll protect me! I, I can't take this uh, alone! At this rate, he's gonna k kill me! <laughs> Don't... hurt me. I, I don't blame you for what happened. B but if you're not there for me, I I'm d done for. So please... I don't like pain. Tears trickled down her face. I was scaring her. Every couple seconds, her shoulders trembled. I slowly let go of her. Please. Wake up. Oh no! Huh? The floor started shaking violently. An earthquake? It was bigger than the last one. Oh! Uh. <laughs> I was struck with a violent ringing in my ears. 
It was such an intensely shrill, resonant sound, my head felt like it was about to burst open. It felt like my ears were being pierced by thousands upon thousands of needles, as though my brain was being stirred into mush by a blender. And then... Oh no! Dude, that earthquake has wrecked him every single route thus far. They're probably gonna have to, like, stop that. I wanna know, like, what that actually is. I mean, I know it's Nozomi doing something, but is it, like, them getting full control? Is it them, like, sending out, like, a mass hysteria? Did they say that at one point? I can't remember. I just know that it's not good, whatever it is. <laughs> I was hit by an enormous impact, and a blinding light dyed my vision completely white. I was awash with an elusive feeling of being immersed in lukewarm water. The waves gently rocked me back and forth as I drifted along its surface. Oh, he's in that dream, yeah. As I slowly opened my eyes, a vibrant blue sky spread out before me. It feels almost like I could fall into it. It was a rather strange sky. The sun was nowhere to be seen. Even though I was supposed to be in my room, even though it was supposed to be night time, when could I have possibly gone outside? When could it have possibly turned to day? With the last earthquake, I had been out for more than an hour. Maybe this time, I had been unconscious for the entire night, I thought to myself. I remembered the earthquake's tremendous impact, yet another elusive feeling hit me, like the tremors were resonating with the very blood coursing through my veins, threatening to burst open from the inside. Maybe, maybe this was heaven? Maybe I died in that earthquake. Heaven, huh? There was no way an otaku freak like me would go to heaven. That wasn't even mentioning how I hadn't even been able to save my own little sister. How I'd been the worst possible brother to her. How I'd made Demi kill Senna and Kozapi. Oh, did he do it? I did not realize that. I wasn't thinking, did he make her... I mean, like, could he control her mind? Did he make her do it? He couldn't have. There's no way, right? No way. Oh, no. He's got to just be saying that because he, he told her to, right? Not because he actually, like, forced her to? No way. If that's the case. Holy crap. Hell would be a far more fitting place for someone like me. Although, obviously I'd choose heaven if I could. My body didn't feel quite right. I was being overwhelmed by a sensation of... walking on top of a fluffy cloud... I couldn't quite understand it. But regardless of how I felt, I forced myself to get up. The feeling of being rocked by the waves hadn't simply been my imagination after all. This was a world with a never-ending surface of crystal clear water. A world where, no matter where I looked, blue filled my view. And I had been right in the middle of it. Lying down. Where was I? Was this really heaven? But I felt like I'd seen this scenery before. That sky, where is it? A voice resounded within my mind. A voice which rose from the depths of my memories. Right. I remembered now. I'd seen it in a dream before. Beamy had been there. I had talked to her as she looked up at the blue sky, her face clearly one of holding back tears. Was I seeing the same dream as I had back then? But, no matter where I looked, there was no one other than me. There was no one here. 
not even Thimi. It was far too reposeful. Thimi? I tried calling her name, but my words were entirely mute. And yet, even without sound, they created ripples across the calm surface of water. Are you there? Sound was a series of vibrations, and those vibrations, in turn, created waves. Among those waves, just like I had been a few moments ago, there was someone lying down. I stood up. My field of view expanded. The one drifting along the waves was Themi. She was so unbelievably pale. She appeared as if she was dead. Her eyes were closed, and both of her hands were resting gently on her chest. And she simply stayed that way, facing up to the sky, not moving even a single inch. Themi, wake up! Even though I had called out to her, she didn't react. She was dead. I knew that for certain. But it wasn't just her. The world itself was dead. And so I just stood there, not knowing what to do. Huh? Right at that very moment, Thimi's prone body gradually sank beneath the surface of the water. As soon as I realized what was happening, she was already completely submerged. How was I standing on top of the water at all, I wondered. Curiously, I fixed my gaze below the water's surface. Beyond it, there was only darkness. The sky was so bright, and yet, even though the water was so clear, below it, there was only an eternal darkness that seemed to swallow all. And Themi, still lying on her back, was slowly sinking farther and farther into its depths. I had to go after her. I needed to wake her up. But as soon as that thought crossed my mind, even though I had been able to stand on the water until then, all support suddenly disappeared out from under me. Oi! I sank. My body grew heavier with each passing second. It was like I was underwater, but it wasn't as though I couldn't breathe. The water was very warm, too. I just wanted to drift within this comfortable sensation for all eternity. That was the way it made me feel. If I had to give an example, rather than ocean water, it was more like amniotic fluid. This very well might have been how a fetus felt inside its mother's womb. Interesting, we're going back to, uh, going back to birth, huh? Okay. I thought the darkness continued forever, but in truth, there was a bottom to it. It was so dark, I couldn't even see my feet. I simply felt an odd, sticky sensation on my soles. I stood in the middle of the darkness. When I looked up, I found I could no longer see the surface. That blue sky, too, had been veiled completely by the darkness. Huh? The sole source of light was a single ray that descended down from above like a thin thread. Much like a spotlight would, it pointed to a single place. And yet, unlike a spotlight, there was nothing beneath it to be illuminated. It only lit up a meaningless spot. Nervously, I stepped into the light. It was ever so faint and gentle, but the moment I bathed in it, my chest began to ache. What was this sensation? It felt almost as if I could cry at a moment's notice, as if my heart itself was being rended. That was the sensation that overtook me. Where could Themi be right now after sinking all the way down here? Relying on the faint light source alone, 
I made my way out from beneath the spot of light, then searched the darkness. Soon, my toes hit something soft and yielding. I kneeled down, and this time, tried touching it with my hand. What I felt was so cold, it was capable of freezing my very fingertips. Little by little, my eyes adjusted to the darkness, and before long, I realized something. I was touching a person. A person lying collapsed on the ground. Demi. Uh, okay. Wake up. I tried shaking her. Demi, wake up! But there was no reaction. She wasn't breathing. Taking her feeble hand, I measured her pulse. She was dead. She had no pulse whatsoever. Dismayed, I strained my eyes to examine the surrounding darkness. Only to find that she wasn't the only one. Oh my gosh, what the frick? Countless other demies were collapsed on the ground, almost as if this place were a burial ground. And every single one of them was dead. Oh, that's right, because she said different copies, right? So she really is like a delusion, right? But is she like a delusion of a delusion of a delusion, like, like in perpetuity? Okay. This was a graveyard. The graveyard of her heart. That was how it felt to me. Suddenly, countless bubbles sprang forth before my eyes. And within each and every one of them, I could see different versions being displayed. An instinctive realization came to me. And I knew then that these were Demi's dead memories. Oh, okay. Don't, don't open your eyes. Oh, okay. Whew. Oh, whew. Thought that was going to get scary. My first memory was one of falling rain, with gloomy, leaden clouds overcasting the sky. How long ago had that been? It was around the time I was just an elementary schooler. Maybe six years ago? It didn't matter when it happened for my memories were not continuous. In it, I saw my dad, whose head had been blown away, and my mom, who had been crushed completely by steel right next to me. What the frick? Even though only a moment prior, we had all been celebrating inside the car, happy as could be about our family trip. Oh. An enormous truck had closed in on us, and before I even knew what was happening, the car I had been in had been completely flattened. I had then been struck by an intense pain, and my consciousness began to grow blurry, feeling as if my very body was being torn apart. The sharp squeal of brakes played an endless refrain for my ears. Dang. My next memory was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table, and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. It was right after losing my parents. Maybe five years ago? It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. I was told by your doctor that you had seen something akin to a sword. Can you hear me? Son? I had a feeling someone had called my name, but I could no longer recall what exactly that name was, for it was now a dead name. It seems as though your wounds have not yet healed. I imagine having your parents die before your very eyes must have been quite the shock. Well... I am more than satisfied with only being heard. I am Norosei Genichi, the honorary director of this A.H. Tokyo General Hospital, as well as one of its sponsors. 
You are here because there exists the possibility of you being a gigalomaniac. And by all means, I wish for you to awaken to that power. Fortunately, you have no more existing relatives, so we should not experience any troublesome guests knocking at our door. Yo, they killed them. Oh my gosh. Oh, they killed them. That freaking sucks. No freaking way. So she's real. I, I, I keep thinking she's d a delusion because of what they keep showing me. And then I forget that they... I, I'm remembering now that they did say different stuff about her that makes her seem real. So, bro, I don't even know anymore. I don't even freaking know. I feel like I have to assume she's real, right? Oh, man. With that said... Beginning today, you shall be treated as deceased. From this moment forward, you shall spend your days in this basement. You needn't fret. No one knows of this room but I. So I beseech you, put your utmost into awakening. I have high hopes for you. You are a guinea pig and I will take the full liberty of enacting various experiments on you in order to determine what is necessary to awaken the powerful unawakened. Yo. I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling, for I hated the dark more than anything. Dude. My next memory, too, was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. How very perseverant you are, young lady. Your back is full of lacerations, with blood pouring out in every direction imaginable. And yet, you resist. Why is that? As I have told you many times, if you simply do away with this struggling and awaken, you will be at peace. I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. What the frick, bro? My next memory, too was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. <laughs> Is it painful? I am merely cutting the surface of your skin. As much as it will bleed, it will not be enough to kill you. If we leave it untreated for three days, it will superate, and then the itching should begin in earnest. That is when the real experiment begins. But please, worry not. I am a doctor and one that is more than capable of handling a scalpel. Let's see. About ten locations should suffice. <laughs> I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more.
Bro, how long does this go on for? My next memory, too, was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. Is that so? Does it itch so? Well, I am afraid that despite this affliction, you may not scratch it. Humans are quite the interesting creatures. They can handle pain to a surprising extent, but the same does not apply to any form of itching. To this end, rather than pain, utilizing itching may prove far more effective for shattering one's psyche. <laughs> I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would soon be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. And then, I killed my own self. What the frick? What do you mean? What? My next memory, too, was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. What the frick? <laughs> hmm. I suppose this constitutes a comminuted fracture of the upper left arm. <laughs> to think you still have yet to awaken. What could I possibly be missing? We shall leave today's experiment here. Please, rest well in my absence. Yo, what the frick, bro? I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. And then I killed my own self. Bro, this is freaking screwed, bro. They kidnapped a little girl, killed her parents, and is uh, they're torturing her. Hello? I demand vindication. My next memory, too, was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. Waterboarding is a form of torture the CIA used up until very recently. 
it is the most simple and effective technique to best cause great distress in your subjects. With just a small amount of water, it is possible to afflict you with the illusion that you are drowning. That's kind of crazy, the illusion, well. Despite it originating quite a long time ago, this classic method of torture is still used today in the 21st century. Don't you find that rather fascinating? Yo. I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. And then I killed my own self. So she was just killing memory after memory after memory, dude. Holy frick. My next memory, too, was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. <sighs> Despite this being my first time administering anesthesia, I would say it went quite well. How do you feel? You are now in a state of paralysis from the neck down. Not being able to freely move one's body can lead to an accumulation of stress. I'm sure you can imagine why this might be. To begin, let's try having you remain in this state for about a year. What the frick, huh? I will be nourishing you daily via IV, so fear not. Well then, I wish you a wondrous year. Holy frick! I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. As I remained there, I felt like I saw something amid the white light. Something that looked almost like a pair of wings. And then, I killed my own self. Yeah, she's starting to see her D-sword. Why did she have to go through so much to get it, though? My next memory was of a radiant light above an operating table, and nothing more. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. No matter how many times I called out, no one came for me. Nothing moved, and I couldn't move anything. Not even a twitch of a finger. I simply stared vacantly at the light hanging from the ceiling. There was nothing else I could do. As I remained there, I felt like I saw something amid the white light. Something that looked almost like feathers fluttering about. And then I killed my own self. Gosh, dang. My next memory, too was of a radiant light above an operating table, and nothing more. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. No matter how many times I called out, no one came for me. Nothing moved, and I couldn't move anything. Not even a twitch of a finger. 
I simply stared vacantly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. There was nothing else I could do. As I remained there, I felt like I saw something amid the white light. Something that looked almost like feathers fluttering about. And then I killed my own self. Bro. Make it stop! My next memory was of a radiant light shining down on an operating table and a man's voice. I wondered how long ago that was. Having been locked in the basement, I had lost all sense of time. It didn't matter when it happened, for my memories were not continuous. What a truly hideous sight. You have spent one entire year's time lying there. How do you feel? Covered in your own feces, reduced to nothing but skin and bones, and robbed of your very dignity. How does this all make you feel? That is what I ask. Though I must say, please, worry not. I will not kill you. It has been about three years since this experiment began. I've grown so immensely fond of you. I can hardly contain myself. You are an irreplaceable subject to me. Oh, that's a lie. Freaking you replaced her with Nanami. Forcibly awakening a gigalomaniac is extremely difficult, and takes quite a long time. Even still, I need you to awaken quickly. I have high hopes for you, son. I continued to stare fixedly at the lights hanging from the ceiling. For if I did so, my vision would be rendered paralyzed, and it would soon all be over without me having to see anything more. As I remained there, I felt like I saw something amid the white light. Something that looked almost like feathers fluttering down, together with a pair of wings. And then I killed my own self. What number was my current self? Yo. That's enough. Make it stop. Please. To think there was such a tragic past behind Themi's smile. I took one of Themi's corpses that was lying on the ground and brought it close to my chest. It was terribly cold, and I could tell it was devoid of a soul. But even so, I needed her. I want you here with me, Themi. I then wished and crafted a delusion. Wake up. Please wake up, Demi. You're the only one who can save me. I know this is selfish of me, but I need you to protect me. I know this is presumptuous of me, but even though I'm a total loser, I feel like I can change if I'm with you. So please, wake up, Demi! Oh! Oh, frick. The next thing I knew, I found myself in the blue-filled world once again. Waves ran across the surface of the water. And then, slowly rising up from the depths. Oh, my gosh. Were countless themies. Every one of them had their eyes closed and were standing still as could be atop of the water. Eventually, they started moving. However, they didn't do so using their legs, but simply glided across the water. One Demi then overlapped with another, and that same one overlapped with yet another one. Oi! The Demis are merging together. Oi. Dumbfounded, I just stood there and watched. Oi. Eventually, 
there were only four of them left. Then two. And then, the last two Dimis slowly melded together and became one. Oh! <gasps> oh no! Her eyes opened. And then, she looked at me. Could this Dimi have been the one I knew? That Dimi? Or was it an entirely different one? I didn't know. I was afraid to call her name. So I waited for her to say something. But instead of speaking, she showed me a warm smile. Be she! What the frick? Raising her hand to her head, she struck her usual pose. Dimi? Is it really you? Yeah. Dimi nodded, and then she embraced me. I buried my face in her chest. The feeling of her soft, supple breasts spread across my cheeks. Gravity soon disappeared, and the two of us began drifting along the blue. Oh! Oh, that's wholesome. That's not lewd. That's wholesome. Holy frick. I heard your voice, Taku. Wake up, Dimi. You cried out to me. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> With her still lying on the ground, Dimi held me as she gently stroked my hair. I couldn't describe how wonderful that felt. It was as if the very essence of all her kindness and warmth was enveloping me. It reminded me of how I felt when my mom hugged me back when I was a kid. How safe I'd felt in her arms. I wanted to stay like this forever. But at the same time, I wanted to confirm for myself that she really was Dimi. So I turned my head just enough to look at her face. Are you crying? For me? Ha <laughs> you're such a crybaby, Taku. Even with that horrific past behind her, she still had the brightest smile. I remembered everything, you know. All the countless things I erased by killing my own self so many times before now. But I wonder if it would be easier if I didn't remember. Dimi, despite looking like she was about to cry, still made an effort to show a smile. She entwined her fingers with my hair. Hey, do you wanna... kiss? Huh? <gasps> oh my gosh! That's so freaking wholesome! Before I knew it, my chin had forcibly been raised slightly. A captivating aroma filled me, and something warm and tender pressed up against my lips. <laughs> right before me was her face. Her eyes were closed. I could feel her soft breaths. So this was a kiss. So sweet and so pleasant. It felt like my brain itself was turning to mush. From just a kiss alone, my heart was filled with love for her. An otaku freak like me depended on her so, yet even still, desired her everything. I closed my eyes and engraved that sensation into my memories. When I opened my eyes again, I was back in my room. Dimi was lying down on the floor, with me still in her embrace. Slowly, she parted from my lips. I'm back. 
Yeah. Mimi was acting shy. Something I found incredibly cute. Our eyes met. The two of us were blushing hard. Had girls' bodies always been this soft? Huh. 3D for the win. <laughs> Not now, dude. Come on. Finally. Even I got a real girlfriend. Nobody would ever call me an unpopular otaku freak ever again. I did promise that I'd protect you after all. Y you'll... Protect... Me? I will. I'll protect you, Takami. And Nana-chan. Huh? What was she trying to say? Ignoring my confusion, Dimi averted her gaze from me and looked up at the ceiling. Before, I had Takami save my heart. And now, I've had Taku rescue my heart. So, this time, I'll be the one who protects you two. I still didn't understand what she meant by Taku and Takami, but what I did know was that if she was there to protect me, I wouldn't need to worry about anything anymore. She was a gigalomaniac, and she would keep me safe. No matter what Shogun had asked her to do, she'd be able to pull it off. As long as I was with her, that'd be enough for me. I'll try my absolute hardest. I'll try my hardest to atone for my sins, but also to return the favor I owe you both. Atoning for her sins? Was she talking about what she'd done to Senna and Kozapi? But that had been legitimate self-defense. She hadn't had a choice, and that should have been how she thought about it. But what felt far more strange to me was how she'd said you both. Who else did she mean? So, I need you to sleep for now, Taku. I could feel the vibrations coming from her body at her every word. Even now, her fingers were still stroking my hair. I felt so at peace. And... So very sleepy. Reveling in the happiness of falling asleep in her arms. I closed my eyes. Huh? Okay. By the time Sakihara Dimi left the container, the world around her had changed beyond recognition. A city of death. That was the most fitting description. Countless buildings littering her surroundings had collapsed, and those that had avoided such a fate had deep cracks ripping through them. The third melt. I never would have thought it'd be this huge. We were too late. Norose Genichi moved Noah 2 into full-scale operation earlier than expected. Following that voice, a boy on a wheelchair appeared before her. Oh no. This old building was not wheelchair accessible. And yet, despite the fact that it should have been impossible for someone in a wheelchair to ascend to the roof on their own, there he sat but Themi showed no signs of being surprised by his appearance. It looks like you've returned to your former self. There's no such thing as my former self. It's more like... I'm back to the person that Taku wished for. Yo. And the fact that Taku did wish for me to come back, I can't explain how happy it made me. He used his power without a D-sword again. If we push him just a little bit further, we can awake- It's okay. You can leave Taku alone. Cutting his words short, 
Dimi spoke with an intense conviction. I'll take care of Noah too. I'll save Nanachan. And I'm not going to let you die either. You can't face Norose alone. And, as I've been saying for so long, you deserve a normal life. Oh, that's what he meant. Because she never had one. She was a torture device. Or not a device, but she was tortured for her whole life. That's why he said that. I didn't know. I thought that that was going to be a more esoteric thing, but it's actually so on the nose, it's not even funny. Oh my gosh. That's so sad. Well, here's the thing. I made a promise with Taku. Looking up to the overcast clouds, Dimi gave a fleeting smile. I promised I would protect him. So I've gotta go. Bishi! Dimi. Walking past the boy in the wheelchair, Dimi proceeded down the stairs, and the boy, deciding not to follow her, or rather, being unable to, sank deeply into his wheelchair and let out a great sigh. <sighs> You're planning to sacrifice yourself, Dimi. No. Noah too, the bringer of calamity, or perhaps the creator of a utopia for humanity. Whichever it was, it meant nothing to Dimi. Whichever it was, it was something Dimi had to destroy. Noah too's location was already a known fact to her. A mutual recognition, silently, yet tactfully planted into the people's consciousness. Despite it being right in front of Shibuya Station, despite the building having been demolished years ago, it was there, with none suspecting a thing. No one even tried to go inside. Dimi opened the door toward the former planetarium, where no signs of human presence could be found, and stepped inside. Oh, that's right, it was a planetarium. I forgot. So, is it at Nozomi? No, it can't be. It's, it's, yeah, because in, uh, in, in Senna's route, we had to leave Nozomi Corporation to get to the planetarium, so. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I forgot. Okay, planetarium, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dimi's eyes went wide at the scene she saw before her. There stood a device that was beyond enormous. Enshrined in the center of the dome-shaped room, it could be described only as a monster. An ominous sound rang faintly throughout the spacious room. It was a low-pitched noise, akin to the deep growl of a beast a sound that signified the device's operation. Noah, too. Nanachan! Nishijo Nanami was being held captive right next to the device. Her uniform was torn, and a bandage soaked with blood was wrapped around her right wrist. Her head hung toward the floor, and she looked terribly, terribly pale. Faced with such a pitiable sight, Dimi was at a loss for words. Crucified, in Jesus of Nazareth's likeness. No, what held her now could not be called a cross. It was something far different, for it took the shape of pure, unadulterated malice. The entirety of this world's evil, the entirety of this world's disorder, the entirety of this world's immorality. It would be no exaggeration to refer to it as a symbol sculpted to those very attributes. Keeping her guard up, Dimi swiftly checked her surroundings. 
there was no one else there besides Nanami. She found no traces of the man who had prompted the development of Noah too. The man who had performed ruthless, torturous experiments on her. Norose Genichi. Although surprised by that fact, Fimi prioritized Nanami's rescue and ran toward the tableau crucifying her. Nanachan, hang on! <sighs> Lowering Nanami from the tableau, Fimi sighed in relief after confirming she was still breathing. First and foremost, she had to get Nanami somewhere safe. To achieve this end, Fimi went to pick her up. However... Oh, frick! Oh, I didn't know that was the sound of her getting cut! What the frick? Oh, no! <laughs> An intense pain surged in her back, as if something was gouging out her very flesh. Fimi vomited blood. Blood that stained Nanami's uniform. Frick, bro. My, it's our first time seeing each other again after so unbearably long. Yet not even a greeting. Enduring the pain, Fimi turned her head. Ew! Norose Genichi was standing right behind her, and in his hand was the tablau that had been clasping Nanami only a moment ago. However, it was not a tablau, but a sword. Norose Genichi's D-sword. That very blade was now piercing through her body. Norose slowly drew his hand back. The sharp blade of his D-sword bored into her body, slid through her flesh, and scraped against the surface of her bones. Her body arched in involuntary spasms, spurred on by the sharp, agonizing pain as her body was slowly being sliced apart. Shouldn't you be more than accustomed to the pain? At last, Norose's sword released her. A torrent of blood came gushing free. Every nerve in her body was screaming out in agony. Even now, she felt as if she was about to pass out from the sheer pain. That girl is a precious decoy required to lure out Nishijo Takami. Having her taken away on a whim would present quite the trouble. Dimi was well aware of the magnitude of Norose's powers as a gigalomaniac. She had been imprisoned by the man for over three years, after all. Oh, it was only three years? Okay, I thought it was like half her life there for a second, okay. In a fair fight, she would not stand a chance. And in this situation, he would never let her go. The mere idea of doing so would have been unfathomable to him. At the very least, I have to make sure Nanachan escapes. The taste of blood spread through her mouth. She was continually assailed by the fierce urge to vomit. The open wound on her back was hot, as if seared by flame. The sheer pain coursing through her left her unable to move. Blood was still rushing out without pause. It felt as if her consciousness was about to be severed. It was so terribly cold. Her eyes grew hazy, and amid her fading vision, she saw what resembled a scornful smile forming on Norose's face. This might be it for me. Dimi couldn't envision a delusion in which she managed to escape from this man's clutches. Only despair governed her heart. I'll grant you my power. Oh, Frick, is that Shogun? <gasps> it was a voice Dimi knew very well. Nishijo Takami, 
or the boy presenting himself as Shogun. Yeah, I knew it! Oh, dang! The voice came from a distant place. If defined, it was in a manner akin to thought transference. In other words, telepathy. A feat made only possible by gigalomania. I grant my final delusion to you. Takumi? I'm sorry for leaving you with such a difficult duty. I've come to understand that it's impossible to go against your will, so I won't try to do so anymore. You plan to die, don't you? If there was a way to fix things without dying, I would have done it. Given that he has not awakened, there isn't much I can do. So, at least let me do this. Let me grant my final delusion to you. W what are you saying? There's no reason for you to- Even though he had no presence in this place, Demi shouted at the person she was speaking to. You are the one person I absolutely cannot let die. I was the source behind all of this, so I can't let you suffer for it. But- That's enough. Demi, I need you to kill Norose. And then, I need you to destroy Noah too. I will provide backup. Dimi's teeth sank into her lip, and she wiped away her tears. Despite it growing more and more distant with every passing second, she did everything in her power to hold on to her consciousness. Oh frick, what kind of backup is he gonna supply, dude? She real booted her D-sword. Countless fluttering feathers came falling down. Cradling Nanami with one hand, she held her sword in the other. The dripping sound landing at her feet conveyed the terrible amount of blood she had lost. The bleeding had yet to stop, for her wound was one that would never allow it to. <laughs> A single slash of Norose's D-sword, one capable of bringing down all that stood against it. Oi. Dimi took the blow with her sword as she covered for Nanami, but their difference in weight proved fatal. Dimi could not take one of Norase's blows head-on with her small build. Dang. She was blown backward, and she slammed into the wall behind her. <laughs> A crack tore through the wall of the planetarium's dome. I even went to the great trouble of letting you live. And this is how you repay me? Do you still desire more torment? Norose slowly walked toward Dimi. His face was one of pure, unending confidence. Every facet of his being stood high above, looking down on her with great derision. Ev Ever the sadist. Aren't you? Dimi grinned, but her smile was a strained one. And then, for some reason only she could have known, she swung her sword toward the cracked wall behind her. Ooh! The wall collapsed, exposing the scenery of the outside world. It was raining. Dense rain clouds coated the sky. Do you mean to run? I won't run away, but... Dimi sat Nanami down on the ground, releasing her from her hold. Still holding her sword tight, she wrapped her arms around Nanami from behind. Nana-chan has nothing to do with this. Oh! Dimi crafted a delusion, a single dazzling ray of light. Oh! 
by the time the light had subsided. The wing-shaped D-sword Dimi held was no longer there. In their place, snow-white feathers had grown from Nanami's back. Pure, untainted wings enveloped the blood-stained girl. It was a gruesome, yet unendingly beautiful sight. Her form was like that of an angel. Nanami was unconscious. Yet, as if they had a will of their own, the wings that adorned her began to flap. Dimi parted from Nanami. Deeply bemused, Norose watched as Nanami flew up through the giant hole that had been opened in the planetarium. Slowly and steadily, she glided through Shibuya as the rain incessantly poured. Dang! Now unarmed, Dimi watched as she flew. I mean, it can't be that easy, right? Nana-chan, be safe. I see. Using your delusions, you turned your D-sword into a pair of wings. Do you no longer plan to run? Norose already had Dimi within range of his own D-sword. He could send her head flying with a simple swing. Nevertheless, Dimi stared right back at him, bereft of all fear. I can't run just yet. Because I have to kill you first. From her pocket, Dimi retrieved a cross with a dark sheen. Oh, dude, she's gonna kill him with a stake? Let's go! Freaking take him down like Dracula, brother! To be precise, however, it was not a cross, but rather a stake. The same as those that had been used in the crucifixion case. In that very moment, Dimi had just real booted one. Upon witnessing this display, Norose could not help but raise a scornful laughter. <laughs> Kill me with that toy, that plaything. You greatly underestimate me. Uh. The blow was far too fast. Oh, oh no. Norose's D sword, far longer than he was tall, and at a speed thought unthinkable within mortal constraints tore through Dimi's flank. Only when her body had already begun to stagger from the slash did she realize that she'd been cut. <laughs> Dimi collapsed, screaming at the top of her lungs from the sheer pain. Norose's attack was not one meant to kill. He could have killed her whenever he wished at this point but he intentionally refrained from doing so. Approaching the writhing girl, he trampled down on her arm. Repeatedly alternating between pained breaths and gritting her teeth, Dimi eventually stopped moving, for she had no other choice. The tip of Norose's enormous sword was right up against her blood-drenched back, but he had yet to pierce her with it. Would you be so kind as to say that one more time? S stop I will not stop. In light of her request, Norose pushed his sword forward with great strength. The tip of her sword further gouged the flesh of her blood-stained body, clawing even deeper into her. It was as if he was pinning an insect for him to display. So, I believe you said you would kill me? Or did I simply mishear you? <laughs> and yet... Dimi, still lying prone on the ground, reached for Norose's leg with one hand and grabbed onto it. She clung to him as tightly as she could, 
the depths of her teary eyes harbored resolute flames of determination. They glared at the scornful man from below. I will... I'll kill you! I'll put you to rest! Forever! Pulling his sword out from her, Norose kicked Demi in the jaw with all of his strength. Her body tumbled across the floor like a rag doll. It seems that in the time we've spent apart, you have grown to be a rather displeasing human being. You have served your purpose. I let you live believing you were worth using later on. But I find myself no longer in need of you. Dimi was on the verge of death. She tried pushing her body up from the floor and crawling toward Norose. But without her D-sword, and being unable to walk, she might as well have been already dead. Until the very moment your life slips away, I ask that you never let those impertinent remarks leave your mind. But before you reach that end, I propose... Ah, yes. How about I torture you every day for, let's say, 30 years? Inside a delusion, of course. Uh, whoa! Oh, frick! Norose's lips twisted, keeping the collapsed girl surrounded by fluttering feathers within his sight. He formed a delusion. Oh, this is his? He strengthened his grasp on his D-sword and opened his channel into the Dirac Sea. The particles and antiparticles needed to materialize his delusion had now been created. And from those two collections, only the particles, through the signals of light that were established as sight, were sent into Sakihara Dimi's dead spots. That's exactly what I've been waiting for. What? Oh! Oh, frick! Dude, all the eyes! Ew! Ew! Oh, I hate it. Ooh, that's gross. In a single instant, the fluttering feathers transformed into eyes. Until this very moment, the only eyes watching him had been Themis. But now, he was surrounded by an innumerable number of floating eyes. <laughs> Whose eyes are those eyes? It was the last delusion Takumi had bestowed upon her. <laughs> Yo, that's so freaking metal. Let's go. The particles Norose had sent were impeded by the countless eyes, rendering them unable to reach Dimi's dead spots. And those eyes, connected to the Dirac Sea, discharged many antiparticles. An indomitable defense which canceled out the power of a gigalomaniac. Only because he was Nishijo Takami. Only because he was a gigalomaniac powerful enough to create a human being. Only because he had exhausted the final embers of his own life. Could such a monstrous delusion have been real booted? Ew, dude, ew! Gross! Astonished by the eyes surrounding him, Norose gulped. No matter where he looked, there were only eyes watching him. Not only did their numbers refuse to dwindle, but they grew with no end. They buried Norose's entire field of vision, and then they moved in toward him. Norose was instinctively overwhelmed by an intense fear. Gritting his teeth, he swung his D-sword. The cut eyes gushed blood, closed their eyelids, and vanished. But right behind every eye, there was another. No matter how many he cut down, their numbers remained the same. 
Don't look at me! If that's what you want, then don't open your eyes ever again. Yo, dude! Norose suddenly felt a great pressure on his chest, and the very next moment, signals of pain sounded in his brain. Yo. What the frick? That was crazy. As if they were a cloud of mist clearing away, the eyes that surrounded him all vanished without a trace. Before Norose's eyes stood Dimi, and in her hand was the cross-shaped stake, lodged deep in Norose's chest. And thus, that was his end. Yo, let's go. After confirming Norose's death, Dimi fell to her knees, debilitated. She was bleeding terribly, her face pale as porcelain. She was barely even conscious now. Pained, irregular breaths seeped from her mouth. Her eyes no longer saw anything. She could still faintly hear the ominous sounds of Noah too, designating its status as fully operational. I guess I've got no choice but to entrust someone else with destroying it. I'm sorry, Taku. In a faint, almost inaudible voice, Dimi whispered into the air. I don't think I'll be able to keep my promise. I saved Nanachan. I know that's not enough to pay for my sins, but still. Saved her. Dimi sluggishly raised her face. There should have been a section of the planetarium's wall that had collapsed. A section through which the sky should have been peaking. But a few moments ago, it had been veiled completely by a collection of rain clouds. And because of that, she could only wonder. Her eyes no longer allowed her to confirm its color, but Sakihara Dimi showed a faint smile as she looked up to the sky. I still wish I could have seen that sky with you just one more time. Taku, thank you. Oh, I was like, is that it? There ain't no way. When I opened the door to my base and stepped out, a clear blue sky jumped into view. I had the feeling that it'd been raining, but it must have cleared up pretty fast. I hadn't been able to find Dimi anywhere. She had vanished without a single word to me. Once again, she had disappeared on me. I'd been waiting and waiting for hours on end, but she never came back. Instead, waiting outside my base was Nanami. Oh, Taka! Oh, frick! Shogun? Oh, okay, never mind. Ah! Sh Shogun! Moving very slowly, the wrinkly boy in the wheelchair looked directly at me. Terrified, my legs gave out on me, and I fell to the ground. You're free now. Huh? In less than an hour, my time will come. The entity posing a threat to you was killed by Dimi. Hearing her name sent a wave of relief through me. Dimi had... 
tried her hardest to protect me? I was the one who hid Aoi Sena in Orihara Kozue's corpses. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think we thought that, didn't we? Yeah. Dang. Nanami was safely admitted to the hospital. Therefore, you're free now. I didn't understand. Wasn't he my enemy? W what about Dimi? Where did she go? Dimi won't be coming back. What? I do. Shogun, skillfully maneuvering his wheelchair, turned his back to me. I blinked once, and within that time frame, one that hadn't even spanned a single second, Shogun had vanished without a trace. What the heck? What had just happened? Only a couple moments after that, I heard a low-pitched quaking noise in the distance. Looking over toward the center of Shibuya, I saw something. As if there had been a giant explosion, a single cloud of dense black smoke was making its way up into the sky. Something had happened. No, something was happening. An uprising? Something paranormal? Or... Maybe even a battle between Gigalomaniacs? Whatever it was, it scared the heck out of me. That mysterious appearance from Shogun had also scared the heck out of me. I didn't want to go anywhere near what was happening out there. Dimi won't be coming back. But Dimi could have been over there. She had disappeared once again. And yet, I was surprisingly calm. It was strange. For some reason, I didn't feel like I'd been betrayed this time. This time, I had the strong belief that Dimi was somewhere out there, struggling all alone, trying her absolute hardest for my sake. But Dimi... Haven't you done enough? Haven't you faced enough hardships as it is? Oh, now you care. You shouldn't have to suffer any longer. There's no reason to. It's not right. Oh. I remembered the soft sensation of her lips. I was going to look for her. I'd had enough of not doing anything, of staying in my room all day like a coward. Our future, for both Dimi and I, in the lives that we shared, there were so many incredible, amazing things waiting for us in the future. I chose to believe that, and I knew in my heart that it was right to do so. We'll go to school in the morning. Talk about whatever comes to mind in between classes. Eat together at lunchtime. Then at the end of the day, we'll head back home. Sometimes stopping by a shop or two on the way back. Then, when we do get back, We'll chat for a bit in your room. And then, when we're all tuckered out, we'll say goodbye with a nice wave and a see you tomorrow. If you're fine with that, I can definitely go the distance. I've always wanted to be that person for someone. Now I understood. 
I understood what she meant by those words. How much she wished for a simple life. When I thought back on everything, I realized that the time I'd spent with her had only been a few hours in total, but I had loved every last second of it. I was always happy when I was with her. To me, who had gone through every day all alone as a shut-in, living as though I was dead, Demi's smile had been my sole source of hope. It told me that a bright future existed ahead of me. Demi had smiled for my sake. So now, I should smile for her own sake. I believed she would come back. But this wasn't my usual escapism, hoping to avoid reality. No. This was my resolve. I would believe only in her, for she had promised me she would be with me forever. So, get moving. Move your rear, Nishijo Takami. And so in order to see her again, I headed toward the destroyed Shibuya. Wait for me, Demi. <laughs> this is kind of weird. I'll find you. I know I will. And this time... I'll stay by your side. Oh, that was it. Oh, dang. Oh, man, that was kind of wholesome. Bro. Oh, man. Dang. Man, that was it, huh? Okay, yeah, so she had to... She, had, she finally got the sacrifice that she wanted that she was trying to do through the whole game. Dang, bro. That's so sad. I don't even really know what to say. I still don't think I like this one as much as I do Senna, uh, Senna's and, and Kozue's, though. I still like theirs better for whatever reason. They just... They just had a different feeling to them, different vibe, even though this one was pretty wholesome. Um, I liked the insanity that was Kozue's, and I liked the uh, weird delusion-y kind of, like, talking to God or whatever through a monitor kind of thing that we were doing in Senna's, so... I don't know. Yeah, that was that was good, though. It was still good. Alright, yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah, I didn't really have a whole lot to say at the end there because I feel like there wasn't a ton to say. Oh, frick, I just noticed it says blue sky now. Oh, oh, that's new. Oh, frick, that's got to be what we click because that is, in fact, the last ending. So, okay, I guess I don't have to do none of that skipping the next time, or at least seemingly so. Okay, dang, dude. But as far as this ending goes, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was still good. It was, uh, I mean, it was sad too, just watching her get like brutalized over and over, uh, at the hands of Norose. Um, I, but there wasn't really a whole lot that was revealed to us other than what she specifically went through, like what her side of the story was like during the initial crucifixion delusion, uh, like the fact that she checked on us in the hospital uh, just kind of showing that she cared, I guess, was the thing that it showed us, which we, we already kind of knew. But there wasn't, like, any more info that was, like, revealed to us other than just, like, hey, here's, like, the details of her backstory. Like, we knew that she'd been tortured by Norase. We just didn't know how it happened, right? So they showed us that. Um, I guess we technically didn't know that the the many demis in the that, like, dream world were her dead memories, so I guess we learned that too, but nothing for the overarching story, right? The overarching story was, like, still consistent, like, we didn't, we didn't get any new information that helps me understand that any better. I don't feel like, at least that I can recall. Um, I think the only small tidbit that we, like, got that, like, 
and it doesn't really help with anything, it was just kind of interesting to know, was that Takumi's been watching everybody, even the bad guys, uh, because he was watching Hazuki-san and altering information so that it would throw them off while they were uh, trying to catch on to him, right? Which makes sense, so he changed that date so that they wouldn't be able to probably figure out when he was writing, which then when Takumi saw it, or, or, or was it Yuwa that saw it, I can't remember, um, the dates were all screwed up, and he was like, what the crap, what was that for? Well, now we know why that happened, so I guess that was like one little tidbit we got, but yeah, aside from that, not much more, so... Next time we have the blue sky ending. This is the last ending before the end of Chaos Had Noah. Oh my gosh, it's taken so long to get to this point. Um, but I'm just hoping, dude. I'm not. I'm not even joking. Everything else could go to crap. I just want Bond to live. If Bond is the last remaining character in this game, I will be happy. That's all I want. I want him. I want him to freaking dodge Sua's bullet in this ending and freaking bip him back. That's what I want. Please. He had the whole, like, weird brain thing he happened when the earthquake happened, right? That one time? So maybe he's a gigalomaniac too, I don't know. But we also don't know, uh, from, from Senna's ending, we don't know who the woman was on the other end. We don't know, because I think by that point, Hazuki should have been dead, so it only makes sense that it would be Momose if it's anyone that we know of, right? Because she'd be the only one that I can think of that, that, like that would be like another female character that isn't one of the seven black knights and that would suck because i want her to be with bond it's gonna be so sad dude because they had like a thing going on if she like put a hit out on him or something that's gonna make me so upset oh don't let it be so dude oh don't let me have called that man if i call that that's gonna be the most amazing but also the saddest call i've ever made I don't want it. I hope I'm wrong. But anyway, yeah, I want Bond to live. So I guess we'll see uh, what happens in the final Blue Sky ending next time. So with that, thank you all so much for watching. And I hope to see all of you ruffians in the next video. God bless and peace.